Now we're going to ask for everyone's attention as you gather and, and get take a seat uh, to, for a riveting conversation uh, between uh, Pfizer's CEO, Dr. Albert Borla, and our very own John Hope Bryant. Enjoy your lunch. This is John Hope Bryant. I'm the founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of Operation Hope. And I'm honored to be here uh, with my friend, Albert Borla, who is the CEO of Pfizer. Uh, Pfizer is uh, one of the largest and most respected companies in the world. But since the pandemic, they've been a game changer, a life changer, really helped to change the course of world history as a result of their reaction to and response to COVID-19. My friend Albert became CEO in 2019, I believe January. Little did he know what was coming his way less than a year later. Uh, the response of the company is somewhat known. Uh, they leaned into this pandemic. Typically it takes years to create um, a vaccine. Uh, they did it in less than a year. Uh, typically requires uh, public funding uh, and support. They did it, I believe, with just private uh, fin financing of their own to get this to market. Uh, they have uh, saved, I believe, tens of millions of people's lives. As I describe a vaccine in the COVID environment, a vaccine does not mean you're not going to get COVID. It means that you will likely not die from it or end up in the hospital uh, with a tube in your throat clogging the medical system um, and causing budgets of the healthcare system to explode, which was, as we know, as we think back, was a big problem. It means you can, uh, in all likelihood, recover at home. It feels like the flu or a common cold and quickly soon, soon you can go on about your business. That was, by the way, my experience. I'm uh, a Pfizer vaccine uh, recipient. I'm honored uh, to have taken it. Uh, underneath this story, though, is a human story that I think relates to the work, Albert, of Operation Hope. And I want you to lean into this uh, from, from lessons learned. Uh, you, you have you know, Dr. King, who we model some of our work around, um, was a pastor, really, um, a, a, a PhD in theology. But he was asked to lean in in a moment uh, around social justice, around the triple evils of war, racism, and poverty, which were not his areas of study. But he, he was a great leader, and he stepped into that moment. And he and Andrew Young, my mentor, our global spokesman, and the co-host for this forum, um, found their way out of no way and created a rainbow after a storm. We know the rest of that history. Um, Operation Hope, I mean, I'm I'm an entrepreneur, but I had to learn finance and I had to learn banking and I had to help people get access to capital uh, into a world that was not my normal. You have a unique background, which I'd love you to speak to a moment. That is not a typical scientific background. That would be presumptively the head of a company called Pfizer, but you have taken that and made it, uh, allowed you to sort of think outside the box. And I think that when I think about what you've done at Pfizer, I think about how you brought capabilities and culture together. And now you've got this uh, Pfizer purpose blueprint uh, and core values of courage, excellence, equity, and joy. How do these things have any, what does these things have anything to do with being able to rally a team uh, to create uh, uh, the first ever vaccine of its kind uh, in the middle of the first pandemic of its kind in 125 years and turn a negative into a positive. First of all, John, thank you very, very much for your very kind words, which I accept on behalf of the 80,000 colleagues in Pfizer, but they work very hard to achieve what you described. I may be the face of the company and the person that uh, most of people know when they connect Pfizer, but uh, there are thousands of people that work very hard to make that happen, and I'm very proud of that. 
I think the, the, the culture of every company is what differentiate it from another. Um, of course, um, companies, they have infrastructures. Most companies have. We have great people. Other companies, people also are great. They are not that they are not good. Uh, we have capital that we will put into, into work to resolve the issues of COVID. Other companies have. Uh, but what is unique company by company, I think it is the culture. And uh, I think our culture helped us. Um, we, we build a culture that we need to be courageous in, in, uh, in the company. And courage was what needed to be able to take tough decisions, to be able to go with an unproven technology. You needed to be very courageous to say no to public money when they were giving like there's no tomorrow. Uh, you need to, to be courageous and to do that because you want to, to secure the integrity and the independence of your scientific team to do what they think right rather than to have to, to respond to, to questions where the money were used. Uh, you need excellence because if uh, you, you have all of that, but you don't know how to put one and one together to execute a clinical study of uh, that size, uh, it's impossible to do. Uh, equity, it's a very big part of our DNA because we are a company that uh, the products affects uh, health of people and health is a basic human right, I think. So our ability to do that with high sensitivity on equity was what made us price the product very low when it was pandemic, to give for free to billions of doses in Africa, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a, a very big part of how we are thinking. And uh, we took a lot of joy, which is the last part of our, uh, that it gave the, the fact that we knew that we are working to save the world and eventually we did. Uh, made thousands of people work overnight because they were committed to a higher cause. So to answer your question, it was exactly those characteristics that help us to bring, uh, to be the ones that we brought COVID, the solutions and not anybody else. I actually believe you guys deserve, you, Pfizer and I believe the January 6th committee deserve the Nobel Peace Prize for um, uh, really bringing stability back and faith and confidence back into democracy and um, health, um, safety and security, and just giving everybody a sense that that normal is possible at a sustained uh, and heightened level of scale. Because you did this work not only here at Pfizer, you did this work around the world, as you just mentioned, Africa. There are other nations. I mean, the U.S. was the most high profile, as I understand it, but there are other nations also using uh, using the Pfizer solutions. Is that right? Almost 180 countries in the world. And for African countries, through an, an agreement that we did with the U.S. country, actually the poorest countries of the world, not only Africa, everywhere else, uh, they had access completely for free to the vaccine. Wow. wow. For free? For free, completely. Through the deal that we did with the U.S. government, we were giving the doses to the U.S. government at cost, so we were not making money, but we were not losing also money. And the U.S. Right. government offered them for free through a generous grant that the Congress gave to the U.S. government to support those countries. So, uh, and of course, we manufactured billions of doses so that we'll be able to give that. And you developed, again, this vaccine on your own dime. You paid for it. Is that right? <laughs> Oh, that's correct. It was uh, a lot of money that were offered at that time. It was a difficult decision not to take public funding for that. Um, the reason I did it was, first of all, I wanted to stay out of politics because uh, mm. I'm sure that uh, I was certain that the COVID would be politicized. And if you take money from one, the other will criticize you. The other was that yeah. uh, when you take money from a public sector, they never actually when you take money from anyone, they never come without strings attached. Never. And uh, yes. in, in, when you take taxpayer money, I, th I think it's right not to be coming with no strings attached. So that if we were getting the money, then there would be committees after committees that will have to discuss with our internal scientists how the money will be used. If we're going to run a study in Minnesota or in Texas, if we are going to, yes. to do the study uh, with uh, this uh, protocol or that protocol. And I didn't want that for our scientists. I wanted them to maintain their independence and seal them from, let's say, this type of bureaucracy. And that's why I think we also were able to finish first. 
and you, as I understand it, you guys actually came a year later with a um, another vaccine, which was uh, able to uh, be delivered uh, uh, orally, uh, in addition to the, yes, the actually, original it's a treatment. Yeah, actually, we are very, very proud about it because I think it is very unique in the history of humanity. Uh, the same company to come with uh, two very, very different solutions for the same problem and to be the, the main solutions that the world is using. What we are referring to is Paxlovid, which is a treatment. This is for people that they do get COVID and it is an oral treatment that you can get. And... Uh, then basically is uh, helping you to have uh, makes the difference between someone dying or not, someone going into the hospital or not. Uh, the, the studies were 90 percent uh, instead of 10 people going to hospital, only one was going. So that was wow. if you were taking that was a huge, uh, let's say, contribution and re to reduction of mortality and severe disease. So this helps you with and the recovery. Uh, we were able to do both ourselves. Two in two is very high uh, bar. The second, the second vaccine uh, innovation was was helping with, with the speedy recovery. Is that right? Yes, actually, it is an antiviral, um, uh, not a vaccine. So you take it from your your mouth, and its work is to basically stop uh, the virus multiplying. So it's uh, completely does this so it's reducing the virus lock very very fast and that has a clinical manifestation that your symptoms are shorter uh, and uh, way more mild uh, in our clinical trials 100 uh, percent against death it was as i said 90 percent against hospitalization 100 percent again icu so nobody went to icu from the paxlovid team compared to the other team so it was very impressive <laughs> People don't, people, some people still don't know this fact, it just stuns me. But over 90% of those who uh, uh, got the vaccine were able to, uh, to recover in a mainstream, balanced kind of a way, uh, meaning they didn't have to go to the hospital. That most of the folks, the overwhelming majority of folks who went to the hospital or who, God bless, died from this were unvaccinated. Uh, so, what you've done is literally change. Uh, the course of world history. That's why I mentioned the, the, that I thought that you guys uh, have earned the Nobel Peace Prize for uh, that work. And you're such a humble spirit, Albert. I, I'm honored to call you uh, a friend. Uh, talk a little bit about... It's an honor um, to call you a friend, John. Thank you, sir. Talk a little bit about your... Uh, and we'll talk later at another time about what we're going to do together uh, through Pfizer and Operation Hope, but that, that we'll do that another time. I want to stay focused on this thought leadership conversation in the, in the brief time you have uh, today, because I think that a lot of people can get out of this. So the whole theme of, of our forum this year is bridging the divide. And, I'll, and I'm going to sort of come to why I think your example is a great example for bridging the divide. But let's talk about your background, your personal background, and uh, it's not the traditional background, I believe, that somebody would assume would be the case for a company like Pfizer. And how do you think, Albert, that background helped you to think differently uh, in this moment? Yeah. Do you share with the audience? No. I, I, you know, I, some people, a lot of people are saying it's not the typical background. But, you know, I think it's very typical for many in Pfizer. Uh, now, I come from a very small country, uh, from Greece. But uh, mm -hmm. if you see our leadership team, uh, the head of commercial was born in South Africa. The head of, uh, of uh, innovation uh, was born in Tanzania. The head of HR was born in uh, Afghanistan. I can go on and on. I'm Greek, and then we have a Swedish head of, uh, of uh, R&D. So Global there is an, an amalgam. Yeah. So, and I think uh, that makes Pfizer stronger. And actually, I think that makes America stronger, this thing that... Uh, immigrants can find their way here and uh, build, let's say, a better country. I'm coming from Greece. Uh, I was recruited by Pfizer in Greece. I'm a veterinarian. And I had a very international career. I stayed only three years in Greece from with Pfizer, the first three years. And then I moved in five different countries, uh, eight different cities of five different countries. Uh, that uh, made me, uh, gave me um, 
something that it is different, I think, this uh, global perspective and ability to respect uh, cultures and diversity. Yeah. And I wanted people to hear that from your voice in your mouth. And uh, again, we'll talk another time about go deeper into your personal story at another time. I think it's really fascinating. But just that piece about your background, but also that you had a you were a veterinarian. I mean, that, and, and, I'm a and, veterinarian. And, some, and to come from that unique perspective and to be able now to think differently and to bring a whole new, fresh tapestry of work to uh, Pfizer and to, to rally this team uh, so that you're all better together uh, is quite remarkable. Now, we are trying right now, Albert, to, to, to show the world that we're better together. We're trying to bridge the divides that separate us. Um, we talk a, a lot about culture. I think culture is not the most important thing in business. I think it's the only thing in business. I think it's the only thing in life, on your block, in your household. What kind of culture are you building? How, what advice would you give leaders watching this about the, it's not just the power of your product, the power of your innovation, uh, the power of your balance sheet, uh, the fact that all these heads of state were calling you at one time uh, for over two years, uh, your phone was a hotline from heads of state around the world and, and really making that decision to not take public money so you could be, uh, speak truth to power respectfully. Talk about the power of culture and how that informs purpose in your purpose blueprint in the last few minutes we have. I think the power of purpose is extremely, extremely important. We know that uh, every organization that is staying true to purpose performs better. That's the same for business, that's the same for academia, that's the same for your institution, for example. If you have a purpose and you stay true to it, you perform way better. And there are two components to it. One, it is that uh, that it is is becoming the compass is becoming uh, the beacon where everybody aims so the the work of everyone in this organization it is aligned uh, and uh, well coordinated because that's the driver the purpose the other it is that particularly in organizations like ours or yours when the purpose is noble when uh, yeah. your work is having an impact on other people's lives uh, that gives yeah. you uh, such a pride and such a uh, drive that you don't do the extra mile. Uh, you, you 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 take your, yourself to to its limits because you are passionate supporter of what yeah. you are doing. And I think this is what happened in Pfizer, and I'm sure this is what is driving hope to be so successful and so unique over these years. Yeah. And and that is now uh, I'm making a statement, but I'm asking a question. That is now part of the Pfizer culture. Is that right? Oh, yes. It is a big part of Pfizer culture. We are a, clearly a purpose-driven organization. Mm. What do you want in the last couple of minutes we have here, Albert? What do you want uh, leaders uh, to hear about uh, a, 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 a new way they can lead uh, in the world that's in front of us, a way to reset our values in a way that you can do well and do good too? Or do you believe that you can do well and do good too? What do you want uh, the people uh, to listen to about, uh, to understand about what Pfizer pulled off and why or how and how that was unique? I think we talked a little bit about, it's really about your people there and they just thought that there was nothing they could not do. What are the last lessons that you can leave here for leaders? And thank you for your time. Yeah, I would say that people, they don't know what they can and what they cannot do. And if anything, they have a severe tendency to underestimate what they can do. And it is always easy to gravitate so that this cannot be done. If you mm. place a very, very ambitious goal, something that really looks impossible to be done, and you yeah. don't take uh, off the pressure that this is the goal, you will be surprised how much your people will achieve. Instead of wasting time to try to convince you that this cannot be done, when they use this intellectual power to find ways how it can be done, you will be surprised. And this is exactly what happened with COVID. It was a zillion of topics that were in our way and obstacles. And those people found brilliant ways to overcome it. The first reaction was cannot be done. But then when they knew that the world's safety 
is dependent on them and that failure is not an option. They found solutions that surprised themselves to start and all of us. The world's safety was at was in hanging in the balance and a no was not acceptable. Uh, you have met all of you, one of the most extraordinary leaders today, I believe, in the world uh, in Albert Borla. And what they've done at Pfizer, I think, literally has changed the world and saved millions, tens of millions of lives. He takes no for vitamins. He believes success is going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. I believe he has confirmed my thesis that you can do well and do good too. Don't let the perfect become the death of the good. Just get up and lead. Uh, and it's, I guess is what we don't know that we don't know that's killing us, but we think we know. But what we do know is that we have, we lead by purpose. And Albert, you've led by purpose and you have, you've created an organization uh, that has deep purpose and roots and you've helped to change the world. Thank you, my friend. Thank you very much, John.